Um, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, speak over the recording announcement. Got it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Natasha Wells Dixon. I am the current chairperson of the East Anglia branch for IOSH. Um, and this afternoon, we, me, myself, and Angela are coming to talk to you about yeah. <laughs> a little wave. Um, coming to talk to you about the road to chartership with IOSH. Um, it's a bit of a mix of information about what that looks like and some of our experiences. Um, myself and Angela have both been through the chartered route um, and the pain that you're all looking forward to, I'm sure. Joking, it's not painful really. Um, you just have to know how to manage it well. Um, just as a start really, I'm going to share my screen because we have got slides this afternoon, so I should remember to do that. Bring it up. Can we see those, Angela? Perfect, excellent. Um, so just to let you know a bit about me first, I should tell you, um, like I said, I'm chair of the Irish East Anglia branch at the moment, um, have been for about eight months, nine months. Um, I'm also a consultant and trainer for She Advisors, which is a business that I own um, and have great belief in. Um, I've studied at degree level in social sciences and business functions so social sciences sociology psychology how people interact is really my bag um, and I've got a big belief in developing people which is what I spend my life doing um, I also work with a local safety group for local businesses and I'm a senior assessor at some festivals for environmental aspects um, and in my spare time those are some of my menagerie of animals that keep me busy, <laughs> just to give you a smile at the beginning of this. Um, and um, uh, mum and wife and Anne and all that stuff that we have to do in the background. I'm not sure how I fit it all in sometimes, but I do. So I suppose the first question is why? Why, why chartership? Why, why see my arch? Why does anyone want those letters? Um, for me, it was it was a, a want to validate where I was at, I think. Validate that I did know that I could shoot from the hip, that I was able to, to advise people in a, in a suitable fashion. And, and also to give me the opportunity and the push, I think, to maintain that knowledge because chartership is not just about where you're at now, it's about gaining it and then it pushing you along and reminding you that those letters after your name mean something and you've got to do something about it. And I think that's what it was for me. Um, and, and those are and some of the benefits it gives me now, you know, is that you know, I can tell people that I'm at that position, which is great. Um, but what that actually tells people is that I'm maintaining my knowledge. You know, it's very easy in our industry to come out of date very quickly, to forget things that we learn um, and not to keep up with best practice. And that's what chartership does for me I don't know whether you've got anything else Angela other reasons why or benefits that you think of no I think you're right I think for me it was um you go through the learning process don't you you study 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 and then all of a sudden you have to then prove what you know and it's actually quite a good thing to do and as I went through the process I was thinking oh, yeah, actually I do know this yeah I do know that and then when I came through and got those letters after my name yeah it does give you that confidence does it and and yeah it's a great thing to do and really important and I hope people treat it as important and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later amazing thanks Angela and yeah, I think that's really important is that we do take it seriously. It's not, you know, it's not just get some letters after your name and, and have that kudos. It really is a process that doesn't stop. Um, you know, I don't know how long Angela's been chartered. You know, I've been chartered now for nearly five years. And, you know, it's it's still learning. It's still a process. I, mean, I haven't stopped learning just because I've got those letters after my name. You know, you've got to be serious about it and realise that it's not the last thing on the list. Um, so that's a bit about why we done it in the first place. And you will all have different reasons, you know, whether it is yourself and that progression, whether it's getting the next job, another step up the ladder, more money. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why people do these things. Um, and I guess you just need to know what yours is. Now, a little bit of a starter, really, to give you an overview. So there's three main routes to chartership. Um, 
one is where you're diploma qualified and you go through the skills portfolio route that Angela's going to talk to you about. Or you're vocationally qualified, so MBQs and the like, NCRQs, those sorts of things. And then you're looking at um, open assessments or a cognate degree. So if you've got a degree in a subject and you want to go into a chartered safety profession, you start looking at both of those routes. So you have to do both of the things that me and Angela are going to talk to you about this afternoon, um, which I must say, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> um, all of those routes, it doesn't matter which of those you do, you do have to keep your CPD up to date, which is really important. Um, I think Angela's going to talk a little bit about CPD later on um, and touch on it at the same time. As she talks through the SDP, um, so, but your CPD record must be up to date and maintained. Um, and also you have to attend a PRI, a peer review interview. So a panel review to meet other professionals who will assess your competence based on your answers to questions. Um, I'll hand over to Angela. She's gonna to talk to you about the skills development portfolio route um, and what that looks like for those of you who are in that bracket. And then we'll come back and I'll tell you about our open assessments. Thanks, Natasha. I'll just share my screen. Can you just keep an eye on the waiting room, please? Because I've been letting people in as you've been talking. Yeah, I'm here, Angela. I'm keeping an eye on that. Uh, lovely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Brenton. Right. Hopefully you can all see that. Is that OK? Good. I'm getting the thumbs up. We like the thumbs up. OK. Um, right. Let's just move people out of my screen of view so I can see what's going on. Um, OK, so the skills development portfolio, then I experienced this, I think I was a year behind Natasha, actually. Um, so not so long ago. And what I'm going to do is just share my experience with you and just get some tips to you on how to get through it. So whether you're um, studying at the moment or whether you're thinking about studying, just have a little think about this and perhaps it will just give you a bit of a view to, to what you need to do. Right, if I can get the thing to, to move, that's it. Okay, so starting off then. So mine is the diploma route, skills development portfolio, SDP, and then you have to do this wonderful thing called the IPD, Initial Professional Development. And remember, it's all about your professional development. Um, my screen's gonna jump about, isn't it? And then this involves, as we said, a CPD audit and a peer review interview, and we'll come to those a bit later. The NVQ, the open book, that's what Natasha's gonna to talk to you about next. So I'm just gonna um, concentrate on the IPD route at the moment. So once you apply, you get all this information coming through from the membership team. You really need to read that and do what it says on the tin. You know, don't try and shortcut it, bypass it or anything else. It's there, it's all laid out for you. And actually, if you follow it, it's relatively simple. People get really strung up about all the words, but just read it, read it, read it. And don't really start your process until you've followed all of that and all, all that guidance that's given to you. So read the, the skills guide, do what it says. And if you've got any problems, talk to the team, talk to the membership team, email them. They're so approachable and they're really, really helpful and they don't mind what you think is a stupid question because no end of people have raised it before. And if you haven't already, get yourself a mentor. I mean, a lot of people have had mentors through their route up to um, the IPD process, but uh, get yourself a mentor because, you know, they've been through it and they can help you. They can't give you the answers. They can't give you your experiences, but what they can do is just help you through. And then selecting those criteria and you get all this list of what you can do and you have to choose from those um, five different large elements with all those different criteria in them. But look deep into the wording of them. It's, some of them look really complicated when you read them. But actually, when you look into them and break them down word by word, what you need to think is, oh, actually, yeah, I've done something that matches that because what we want you to do is to demonstrate that you have experience, demonstrate the way you work, demonstrate your skills. So you need to draw from your own experiences and make sure you can provide evidence. So don't choose something that you've got no evidence on. 
you might have done a job, but you might not have the emails, you might not have the, the bits in writing, you might not have the bits you need to provide the evidence. And I'll go into evidence in a little while. Part of a project will work. Some people think that when they get these criteria, and it's got to be a great six months or two year project. It doesn't. It can be just a, a couple of meetings and a delivery of a training session. Yeah, it can be that short and that sweet, but it just needs to show your input into it. And, and it's all about you. It's got to be within the last two years. Um, I actually put one in that was, um, it was running from just before the two years and I checked with them and they said that would be acceptable because the majority of that um, sort of project that I did was within the two years. Um, but usually the start and finish date, they need to be within the two years. Um, you can change them. And as we'll see with the next slide, if I can get this into move, oh no, not the next slide, sorry. Um, I'll show you that in a minute, but you can change them. So if you select them and actually you get halfway through it and you think, mm, can't get the evidence for this, you can change horses. So you're not stuck to the original seven. But remember, keep to what you know, keep to what you've done because you've got to have to provide the evidence and it is all about you. So then you go into your, your My IOSH and you see in there, update your IPD online now, initial, initial professional development it's called. And this is just the system. So there are your criteria. So you've chosen making a presentation, using goals and performance targets, contributing to legal actions. These were my choices. But if you see at the bottom, there's two there that were canceled. So analyzing the impact of health and safety requirements, mm, that sounded a bit dodgy and it proved to be dodgy and I couldn't do it, so I needed to change. And then the other one developing or implementing emergency response systems. I decided to change from that because I found something else that I'd got more, more evidence on. And for, that, for today, I'm going to just concentrate on this one and I'll, I'll talk you through it so you'll see how I applied it. Developing and applying safe systems of work. So this is what it was. And if you look on this one, you have to have five minimum activities and seven evidences. So your activity has to be set out in different stages and the minimum stages that you have to set out are five. So this one was how to develop a safe system to, of work. And what I did was, the, the story was, I was working with the local authority as a consultant. We received a message in from a union rep that somebody in the social work team attached to the local hospital had received a needle stick injury. So what I needed to do was to um, see them, meet with them, find out what the problem was, have some workshops with them and develop a safe system of work. So it was a start to finish project. So all of those things, areas to, co to, to cover, that's what I did explain how I established it, demonstrate how I analyzed the task, identifies resources and other practical implications, how we involved others, how it was developed, and then training, briefing, and all those sort of things. And then what you have to do for each of those stages, those activities, you need to do an activity sheet. My thing's jumping about, sorry. So what you have is, you're telling a story to someone. So the person who's assessing the other end doesn't have a clue what you're on about, what your job is or anything else. So you need to tell them like you're telling a story. First, I did this, then I did that. The result of that was whatever. And then we did so and so. So it's as simple as that. So each of those levels has an activity. So activity is a number, description of the activity, the date, what was the outcome, how you evidenced it, and then you upload your evidence in the end column. And I'll show you those in a minute. Activities, five of them, minimum evidence, seven. I put a lot more evidence in, but just think you don't need to overload the assessors either because they've got to look at all of these. The tip from me is, is to create your own file because you're uploading this on a live system and you know what live systems are like, every 30 minutes they throw you out. So I made myself a table, which I'll show you in a minute, which had literally got these columns on it. And then I just literally lifted them out and pasted them into the main system. So you're telling that story, 
you're explaining to someone who doesn't know. So describe it, set the scene, tell that story step by step. So this is what you get. You get my performance criterion. So the criterion there was develop and applying the safe systems of work. So you have to give an outline and a background. Remember the assessor doesn't know what you're on about. So you need to be telling them. So whilst working as a health and safety advisor for the council, we were alerted by a union rep that there'd been a needle stick injury and off I went and this is what I did. So I set up workshops, I went to meet them, we did um, evidence gathering, we did all sorts of things. So, and it's all about me. So it's all about my input into that. They don't wanna know what the rest of the team did. They want to know what you as a health and, profession, health and safety professional have done. So there's your activity, number one, there's your description. The union rep raised the issue surrounding the emergency visiting team and requests help and advice. The date was that. The outcome was health and safety team advised of the issue. Evidence, email from the union rep giving the background and requesting help. And there's the upload, there's the document that I uploaded and I'll show you how we do that in a minute. That is just my activity sheet. So that's my own Word document. So it just reflects what you see there, activity description date, activity description date, and off you go. So you, you write it, you draft it first, you can play about with it in your own document rather than on the main system. Um, and, and then it's a safer way of doing it. You can make sure you tell that story yourself. So here we are further on in the activity sheet. Meeting arranged, that was the next um, activity. Assessors comments come in here, look, accepted, accepted. Further meeting held with the team. Workshops held with the team of emergency social workers. What I did is I sat them all in a room and we literally brainstormed the problem. We had flip charts. What were the barriers? What were the problems? What was the PPE? What were the hazards? You know, how you'd run a workshop. So. My activity five there was the workshop, several workshops actually, start dates, workshops were held. So the outcome there was the workshops were held, task analysis completed, hazards identified, and we worked out what resources we needed. And then in my evidence column, I put in the workshop PowerPoint. I put in the flip chart images that showed we'd gone through the exercise. I put in the safe system of work notes that we were starting to form and there are the evidence in the column. And this was my evidence bit. So this was my file of evidence. So here we've got an action list, we've got an activity sheet, we've got an email from a union rep, we've got email response from the managers, um, we've got initial contact and suggestions there, infection control and needle stick. That was an HSE upload, and I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Shouldn't have done that, so I found out from the assessor. Notes on the walkthrough and talk through, team managers' responses, safe system of work draft checklist. So all those stages, all those evidence stages, I was able to pick up, lift up, and pop in the evidence column. We have to just think about, you'll, you'll see back on that one, some of these email copies, you can see them in pictorial form there. You can probably see little blanked out bits on them. This is why, because we have to protect the innocent, if you like. So we're not allowed to say um, who people are, we're not allowed to identify them because of data protection and because of privacy. So this is literally how I put the evidence in. It was a copy of the email, but I literally just put a pen through it and said, instead of Fred or Bert, I said they were the union rep. And instead of who I copied it to, I copied it to the social work team, but the names aren't in there. So we're not allowed to do that. So please find the flip charts from the re recent workshop written up for you. Please have a discussion on this. I think training is the key. And then the needle stick training was uh, what we were talking about doing. So we're developing the safe system of work. Remember I said the HSE document upload, you're not allowed to do that, so I found out. Um, so HSE references, yes. Reference to other le legislation and leaflets, yes. Reference to others' work, yes, as long as you credit them. Plagiarism, no. Straightforward copies of things, 
no, because I gave the, the team a copy of the needle stick advice from the HSE and I thought, oh, I'll pop that up as evidence. Well, they didn't like that. So I said, accepted. So the whole activity was accepted, but for future submissions, it not, not necessary or acceptable to upload copies or leaflets produced by others. And there's even a deficiency code to tell me where I've gone wrong. So we have to demonstrate our research and that sort of thing. So we just can't lift something that somebody else has produced and popped in there. So make sure it's all your own work. Then we have reflective accounts. Now these are so important. Um, the reflective account really after your activity, I also want to know how you've improved, how, what you've learned, what you've gained from it. So really important to your skills development, what you've learned along the way. And I also already give you the bullet points. So don't deviate from that, just use those bullet points. So these are the bullet points context and background of the activity. So yeah, we pop that in, that's fine. So I was working with the council health and safety team, so it sets the scene. My professional objectives, so the idea of this one was to work with the emergency teams and their manager, get them to identify the hazards they face and develop that safety system of work. So you're telling the assessor what they need to know. My approach, we didn't have much accident data, um, so I met with the union rep, held the workshops, drafted the safe system of work, training sessions on personal safety, loan, loan working and needle stick awareness have been written by me and we put them in and further meetings are going to take place for the monitoring and development. So the approach, reasons for it and the interpretation of the data. So the data we got was those live workshop um, brainstorming um, flip chart sheets that we had and there was all sorts on those and then details of the completed bit so if I can get it to go come on whoops I think we're there aren't we yeah so it just summarizes the, the bits so workshop took place flip charts completed information on flip charts captured safe system of work drafted you're telling that story again, so step by step by step, using these headings that IOSH give you. The results of the activities and the extent to which they were achieved. So I was able to facilitate the workshops, but this is an ongoing project and there's more work to do in support of the SAFE system, but we have drafted it. And then the bit on the reflection is the details of the strengths and weaknesses of your approach and learning points. Um, so that's of the project itself. So Strengths of the project were the willingness of people to take part and the desire of the workers to get them safe. Weaknesses, time, budgets, you know how it goes. And then my strengths and weaknesses. So I thought, yeah, I was really happy with my facilitation of this and the workshops and problem solving and all that sort of stuff, drawing on my knowledge. But then I acknowledged that actually I'm blooming impatient. I just wanted to get on with it. So. I'm sometimes a bit impatient and want to roll on with the projects where others are either unavailable or busy. I found it really frustrating. So I, I think, you know, I just need to sit back and let things happen sometimes. Um, so your reflective account, so that was the reflective account and you just drop it in there at the end after you've done all the rest of it. And my comments were comprehensive reflective account, accepted, thumbs up, all good. Candidate is described the design, development, and implementation, implementation of the safe system of work accepted. So that's one criterion finished. Do it seven times and your SDP status is complete. So you get this nice little thing, the pie chart, if I can find it. Where is it? Do you know what my, something's going on with my mouse here. There it is. As you're going round, you get red, amber and green. So you get the yellow to start with, there's nothing there. Then they go around to green. Um, and when it's all green, it's a really great feeling. And then you get to, well done, you're through and you've done. And then what happens next? This is just the last slide. I'm really jumping about here, I'm so sorry. What happens next? You get the email from membership confirming that you've completed your SDP, thumbs up everywhere what a lovely letter is to get and it explains the next steps then you've got to pay something again I'm afraid pay and book your interview date they do a check on your CP diary 
so just make sure that as Natasha said earlier on that you have done your CPD diary and it's up to date the email from membership says you, your CPD is okay then you get your interview date and then you need to go on to do your presentation submit your presentation three weeks ahead and a record of employment form which is actually your CV then your presentation and interview and I'll come to that a bit later all right so let's stop sharing and hand back to Natasha that was the STP and she's now going to do the open book for you I think we think we think we think <laughs> we hope let's hope I am <laughs> that was a real real um, sort of race through that one but you know there's a lot to get in there there is. It's really difficult when we run these sessions, for those of you who haven't been to our sessions before, the topics that we normally pick are so vast that we have to be very careful what we put in and make sure that the information we do give you is the really important bits. Um, so there is always more to know. And like Angela says, make sure that you go back and review those and look back at the guidance that they send you when you're doing them. Uh, can you see that okay, Angela? Is that all right? We can. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so what do I know about electronic open assessment then? So the open assessment route is the one that I took um, because I done a I done my MVQ studies um, in my my journey, if you like. Um, so and so I know that I know what my experience is. I know what the experience is of others who I've spoken to and where they've been. Um, and I guess you know in the last five years, four and a half five years. Um, I've had a chance to reflect a little bit um, on what went well and what didn't go so well. Um, think about how I did approach the assessment um, and possibly how I should have approached the assessment, maybe. Um, happily, obviously, I'm chartered, so it all went well and stuff. But, you know, you do get a chance after a while to reflect back and see where you would have improved. And hopefully those are the bits that I'm going to share with you um, this afternoon. So what is it? What is this assessment process? So I have run this assessment process nine times over a year. Um, they set 14 day windows up where people can actually carry out this assessment. And you within that 14 day window get to choose a seven day window to do your assessment in. Kind of makes sense, it's very complicated. Gives people the opportunity to fit into a window that works for them. <clears throat> Um, it's done in two parts. So we've got part A and part B. Part A is multiple choice questions. So for those of you who like sort of pub quizzes, this is your part. This is the part that you will love. Um, and, and that's exactly what it is. It is, it's quite quick fire, you know, 48 questions. I don't know why it says eight on my slide. I apologize. It's 48. There aren't eight questions. Um, I'll adjust that. Uh, 48 questions and you get three hours. So you get a three hour time limit to do this. Um, as soon as you have finished that, your, where your seven day window starts to do part B. So they give you get the results instantly for part A and then you go on to do part B. Um, part B is two scenario, scenario based questions, I apologize. Um, and they're 700 words each, the answer, which is quite concise. Um, and takes a bit of effort. Um, the two, just as a note, the two scenario based questions that I had through my um, part B, one was about drop forging. Um, and I don't know how many in the room know much about drop forging, but I definitely didn't. Um, and one was around a print shop, <clears throat> which I had worked in before. So, you know, it may not be that the scenarios that you have are fitted into an area that you know. I'll tell you a bit more in a minute. So part A, so just a few tips really. So multiple choice questions, there we go, it says 48 on this page, that's much better. In one sitting, so it's a three hour block, it's not do a bit, go away, come back. Um, you have to do it in that time frame. Um, and they're not trick questions. Um, I think when I went into part A, I was kind of thinking, oh my goodness, what if they're questions that I just have never heard of? What if I just don't know any of them? And you kind of go into that, that mode, don't you, of worrying that you're not good enough and that you can't recall information. But they're not designed to be trick questions. They are the sort of questions that if you're going for your chartership and you're confident, 
in your knowledge and your, your abilities, you will know the answers to enough of them to get through the assessment. Um, things to think about before part A, you know, what does that time window look like in your diary? What does it actually look like? Does it look empty? And how have you done it? What have you set? You know, you need to keep that space completely free. Block the phones, tell everyone to leave you alone. Ideally be somewhere away from everything. Um, if, if the toilet is the only place you can sit, um, then it's not the right time to do that assessment, okay? If the bathroom is the only place you've got to go, then make sure that you set your start of your seven days for another time. You need somewhere that you can clear your head and be comfortable. I suppose bathrooms are like that a bit. Um, <clears throat> and so make sure that it, you've got the right mind space. Your mind needs to be clear. You know, try not to start it at a period where you've just started a new job or you've just moved house or you're going to move house the next day or someone's having a baby or, you know, there are, there are certain times not to do this process um, to give yourself the best opportunity. Um, and also the last thing, can you clear enough space after that three hour window for your seven day part B? So don't just focus on part A and needing three hours. And a mistake I made was making sure that I had those that day clear to do my first part A, my three hours. And then in the next six or seven days, I had about four days of work out on site. You know, and looking back, that wasn't the best way to do it. I'm not saying you can't work at all in that week. That would be ridiculous. Um, but make sure that you've given yourself enough space to go through it. Um, that is obviously the ideal, a completely empty week um, where you could just put your open assessment in. But you're not going to, we're not going to achieve that. Just get as close to it as you can, is all I would say. So part B, so this is the two scenario based questions I mentioned. These are 700 word answers for each one. Now, those questions, there is a huge question bank. So like I say, it's unlikely that it will be a question that you know, is in an industry that you know. The questions, for those of you that are familiar with the old sort of general certificate studies that used to be done, um, they are very similar to the layout of those. So they'll give you a, a quite a technical question. Um, but it's a technical question that most safety practitioners should know. It's not overly complex. Um, it's not sort of occupational hygienist specialisms, if you like. Um, it's general practitioner knowledge. An example of one of the ones that I had, the drop forging one that I mentioned, um, you know, the drop forging one that we, I talked about was around um, employees talking about the degradation of their hearing. They reported that their hearing was deteriorating. And it asked you in three steps to look at how you would assess that noise exposure, how you would assess what was going on. Um, starts to talk about then asking you to look at hearing protection and how you would assess it and how you would apply the correct stuff. Um, and then about other hazards, other health hazards that you could be exposed, they could be exposed to in that situation. So it's quite, it is generalist knowledge, but it's about understanding, you know, what that's asking for. They tell you how many marks you're going to get. I haven't purposefully haven't put a copy of the full question on the screen in case it really does get issued at some point because that would be wrong um, but that's how they're set up so it will tell you how many marks you've got for that question and you allocate your words accordingly so if it's asking for 10 in the first one sort of 15 in the second and 10 in the last you know that you're roughly a third of your aunt, your correct words for each um, but slightly more in the middle so do it like that um, and plan that week. So that week that we talked about, make sure that you've got a plan. And this is what I think I would have done if I'd had the time to reflect before I did my open assessment, um, which I didn't do, but this is what I would have done if I had the chance to revisit it. So it might look like this. So there's a bit in there about research. And so obviously you're gonna look at both questions, choose which one you wanna do first, which one you might, you know, do you wanna do the most familiar or the least familiar? Um, and I would probably have spent the first couple of days looking at one of those questions, researching the industry, having a look at best practice, thinking about what I might say um, on day two. 
and then documenting it down. So just an initial outline answer for what it is. Like Angela said with the STP, I created my own Word document because you, you can only upload it in one place or one document. So I created my own Word document and then reviewed it as I went and then uploaded it towards the end. <clears throat> it means you can spell check it as well, which although you don't get marked down for wording um, and spelling, it's much more, it's much nicer for you when you submit something you know is correct because it gives you a bit more confidence. Um, in that period of 21 days where you're waiting to find out what actually happened. Um, so research your scenario, initial outline, and then do the same on days three and four for scenario two for the second question. Then on day five, finalise those answers. It gives you enough time before the end of your seven days to reflect back. And like I said about the reflection being important for me in the journey reflection in all learning and studies and report writing in the real world if you're writing a report to senior management you won't write a report straight off and just hit send on the button because you need to make sure that it's correct um, so then day six I would have reflected I would have spent a day reviewing them maybe looking over them having a look back at the research of the industry see if there was anything that I'd glaringly missed um, and then obviously day seven submit your answers um, just a few tips for it. Don't assume that you know anything. So, you know, you're, the person reading this won't know necessarily. They will understand. They're safety professionals, but they won't, you know, they, you need to assume they don't because that's how they're marking it. And don't assume that you know just because you work in the industry that does come up either. I said to you that one of the assessments was drop forging for me and one was a print shop, which I had worked in before. And I was less confident in my answer for my print shop because actually, or I was more confident when I'd done it, but actually looking back, it was the least good answer out of the two because I could have kept a copy so I can have a look at them. Um, but actually my drop forging answer was really good. You know? And as a, as a assessor now, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But the other one was awful. So don't assume that you know, just because, you know, you, you've worked in that industry, do that research day anyway. So make sure that you're up to date because that's the whole point of this process. Treat the scenario as a real situation. So, you know, each of those questions that you're asked in this part, treat it as if it is the SDP that you're doing. You know, imagine that it really is a real situation and that you're actually writing that information for the business owner, the manager, the senior leaders, whoever it is, a record of whatever it is that you've done on site. Um, because then you're more likely to stay real with it. Um, and that's what this being in the moment bit is, you know, give yourself that space to actually be in that place, looking at that drop forging, standing next to the forge, looking at where the vibration and the noises might go around the building. Um, and be methodical. So make sure that, you know, we all know the fundamentals of, you know, of whatever scenario, whatever you want to so plan, do check act, the hierarchy of control, risk assessment processes, you know, hierarchies in noise, ways of controlling things. We know what those are, you know, try and follow one, you know, try and follow that process throughout the writing of what you respond to them with. Um, in preparation before any of that, I would suggest that you do read the guidance. There's guidance from IOSH on this, um, as Angela said about the others, and some frequently asked questions. So there's some FAQs for the electronic open assessment that you can look at and it's a re it's really useful to look at those. They tell you some of the stuff I just have um, and a little bit more. Um, there's a dummy quiz available. There is a quiz when you are, I can't show you what that looks like because I'm not registered for initial I for IPD. So I can't actually show that to you <laughs> um, But as a, on a screenshot, but there is a quiz available. So you can go through that and have a look at it before you go on to this process um, once you're registered. Um, have a go between now and when you actually launch into the process of research and safety practices and how they're applied in other industries that you're not so familiar with. You know, don't necessarily, you don't have to do that in massive detail, but it is useful if you're working, especially if you're working in one industry and have worked in one industry for a long time. What the open assessment requires you to be able to do is to apply that knowledge maybe in another industry. Um, which is what we do as practitioners to make sure that if we move from one industry to another in our career, once we're chartered, we are able to transfer that knowledge. 
So it's a good practice to think about a couple of industries that you're not familiar with and maybe go and visit them, talk to their safety practitioners, have a chat with their safety manager. You probably all know lots of other people in other industries. That's the sort of networks that we move in. So maybe do that. Think about some relaxation techniques. I remember being extremely anxious going through this route. So make sure that you do that as well. Um, and just have confidence in your abilities and your knowledge. If you are at the point where you think you're ready, then you are ready. Um, and I think that's really important to know that when we feel like we are, we usually are and we'll be fine. Um, and just lastly, from me on this bit, um, I love this quote and I like this, like this lady, her quotes are great, um, Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. Start your assessment, put some initial outlines in, think over it, look at a bit more, go back. Yeah. And that's the message I'll leave you with for that bit of today. Any questions, just let us know. Angela, I'm going to hand over to you so that you can talk about these peer review interviews, I believe. Thank you very much. Welcome. <laughs> um, there are a few questions in the, the chat, Natasha, so I'll let you have a little shuffle through them while I do this bit. OK, right. Now we should be sharing screen, shouldn't we, somehow? Share screen. Right, let me find, there it is. Does that work for you? Are we there? Yep, yeah, we've got a thumbs up from Natasha. Thank you very much. Um, right, your peer review interview. Um, I'm a panel member for the PRIs, as we call them. So I kind of see people coming through and I can see where the pitfalls are some of the time. And I sort of know as well what we want as a panel. I, ch I chair the panel sometimes. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few hints and tips on how, how it goes, what the format will be. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you the questions, but I'll give you a little bit of guidance because I'd be shocked if I gave you the questions. So well done, you've made it this far. So you've got through either your SDP or your open book, which is where we want you to be. So you've completed your studies, you've had your CPD audit, and you've had your invitation and your time slot, and you've read the instructions, more instructions for my OSH, but actually they just prepare you for the day. And, and they do tell you when to submit your presentation and um, you'll need ID with you and, and all that sort of thing. So just read those instructions, um, a bit like everything else. If you don't read and look and be careful and prepare, then you're sort of setting yourself up to not be a, a very good candidate. So I, I don't like the word fail. We say refer, not fail. It's a, it's a lot nicer, but we don't get many refers. So don't worry too much because once you've got this far, you then need to demonstrate to us that you know your stuff. So you've prepared your presentation. You've revised from your study material. That is so important. Your study material is, whether it's been open book, NVQ, um, diploma, whatever route you've taken, all the questions you get are gonna be somewhere in that study. So they're not gonna trip you up and ask you things you don't know. So it's now time that you demonstrate that you know your stuff. But what we need to know is about you your input to a project, your input to a risk assessment, your input to a policy, the way you work and how you've made a difference. So there you are, you're sitting in the Zoom waiting room and ready to go. It's not like the table and chairs like on my first slide anymore, although we might get back to that. We used to quite like doing it that way, but we can't at the moment. But actually we're getting through the Zoom ones really, really well and technology is usually reliable. So make sure you have a drink on hand because you're going to be talking for an hour. Uh, a bit daunting, I know, but you are going to be talking for an hour. But if you put yourself in the work situation, like um, Natasha said, you know, make it real. You're either a consultant or you're working as a health and safety person, advisor, manager, whatever you might be for your organisation. The questions you're going to get are scenario based ones that you're going to advise people on. So there's there's nothing that you're you're not going to know, but you are going to be talking for an hour. 
So make sure you're comfortable with no distractions. The number of times we see cats walking across keyboards, dogs barking in the background, children arriving. So it's a bit like, you know, shut yourself away in a darkened room with your laptop. But, you know, you need to be able to focus. You need to be able to concentrate. Um, we like to know you have no notes around you and the IOSH representative who's with us on the panel will very often ask you to either lift your camera or lift your laptop and just show us that you've got a clear desk. Um, no notes is cheating and we don't like cheating. Um, and you have your ID ready, that comes in the form of a passport normally or driving license. And you just show that to the screen, wherever your screen is, up like that. And then they'll do a snapshot of it, which proves your identity. Make sure you know how to use your technology and it's plugged in and a laptop is better than a mobile. Mobile, really, we struggle with, you struggle with. So best to have your laptop with a decent camera. Um, I tell this story about this being plugged in. They do say at the start, make sure you're plugged in, you've got your power. But we had an international candidate. I felt so sorry for the guy. Um, he was, I don't know if he was UAE actually, but he was certainly um, from far away from us and he, he'd worked on a rig. He'd had to fund his own helicopter from the rig. He had to fund his ho own hotel. He had to fund his own internet connection. And the poor soul, he forgot to plug his laptop in. So we lost him halfway through the interview. Um, and because we'd got another candidate coming in behind him, we couldn't get him back. So the, you know, they, they phoned him and I think IOSH did actually help him out on that. And he did come back another day. But, you know, it's so important to people, just make sure your laptop's plugged in. Simple, isn't it? And then try and relax and enjoy. Sounds weird. But actually, we're quite nice people, the panel, um, and we want you to succeed. So we, we like to have a little bit of a smile along the way. So here we go. There'll be a panel of three and an IOS representative, maybe a trainee panel member, but that panel member who's a trainee won't influence your interview in any way. They're there to sort of practice and see if they score the same as the main panel. The format will be the IOS representative will do the introductions and check your identity and just make sure your laptop's plugged in and all that sort of stuff. And they're there just to make sure that everything's done by the IOS book, that we, we don't um, favor anybody or, or anything like that. Um, the chair will then say a few words, hello, how are you, settle you in a bit. You then have your 10 minute presentation followed by eight questions. And it'll take about an hour. Chair asks the first questions. The other two panel members will sort of take turns over the, ne the, the next six and then back to the chair for the final one. So when you come back to the chair, you know you're, you're just about through. If the panel doesn't hear what they want, they've got certain amount of questions that they can ask as supplementary questions they're not allowed to prompt they're not allowed to give you the answer and sometimes it's very difficult as a panel member when you know somebody knows the answer and you're trying desperately to get it out of them but you're not allowed to say a few keywords because it's the keywords we're looking for we'll have our heads down and we'll be marking so we'll be scribbling away or we'll be working on a separate keyboard to record your answers um, the whole thing's recorded but we're, we're looking for key things that we need to tick off along the way. So we're marking, we might have our heads down, but we're still listening to you. So we're not trying to appear rude. We're just really concentrating on you. Roughly an hour. I wouldn't suggest you watch the clock. Forget that, that'll be monitored for you. Um, but believe me, you'll be at the end of that before you even know it because you concentrate so hard that you won't know time's passing. A bit like Natasha said, you know, your general certificate level is somewhere near where this is in a way because it's almost a back to basics of your core is called core skills questioning and it is the core skills of a health and safety practitioner so there won't be any as, as um, Natasha said about you know chemistry labs or those sort of things what we want you to do is we ask you general questions and we want you to draw from your experience and your work and tell us what you do and what your input was so it's all covered in your study and there aren't any trick questions. Core skills, as I said, they want to know that you're competent and how you work. So your competency is what we're trying to find out. So as I said, if you're advising a client or an organization, you've got that knowledge, you've got that experience, to a certain extent, you've got that personality. If you think of the panel as people who you're advising, let your personality come over. 
let your communication skills come over and give the panel confidence that you've got that technical know-how that you know what what we want of you it comes difficult sometimes if you haven't because we ask for examples all the while and if you are in an industry where you only deal with warehousing or you only deal with fire or you only deal with one subject maybe you may not have the all round knowledge. We do find that consultants tend to have a broader spectrum to draw from. So if you go back to your revision, try and think of a few examples. And if somebody says to you, oh, can you give me an example of how that would work? You can say, well, actually it's not my field, but if I was in that field, I would do so-and-so. So put yourself in the scenario, put yourself in that area where you're gonna be advising someone. As we said, treat it seriously. It's important for you and for your career. Um, sometimes we do get people who, who rock up and sort of, they think they've got it. And you can see that actually they think it's just a rubber stamp. It's just a ticking exercise to get you through to the end result of, of chartered member. And they sometimes we feel they don't treat it that seriously. So, so please do, it is really important for you. Um, right, your presentation. This is the first 10 minutes you've got. Keep it simple and to the point. Don't put hundreds and hundreds of words on a, on a, um, a screen. I know I put a lot on a while ago, but there were points that I wanted to get through and this is gonna be recorded. So I needed those points to go on the screen. But for your presentation, you're talking about you, you're talking about what you know, you're talking about your history, your experiences, your, um, qualifications so use bullet bullet points and then expand on them so keep it simple for the people who are watching work on eight to nine minutes and rehearse it please rehearse it you will be timed by the chair but actually nothing is lost if time runs out because we do see your presentation ahead of time so we've got an idea of what you're about but the presentation gives us as the chair chance to, to get a feel of you the way you speak the way you deliver and sometimes we have to deal with accents from international candidates that are not quite easy to listen to and they tend to work sort of speak quite quickly so I would suggest you talk quite slowly and quite concisely and it just gives us a, a feel of what you're about it's not marked but it does set the scene and it gives us a feel for your character and how you present it also settles you in because you're talking about yourself you know what better subject do you know about so yeah it settles you in it's about what you know don't worry about screen sharing we do like you to share your screen but if you can't the IOS representative will look after that for you and don't throw hundreds of slides in you've only got 10 minutes and IOS do provide you with template of of those slides um use that template or use your own it doesn't matter and actually pictures are good if you've got a scenario where you've had an incident or an accident at work or something you're proud of at work, take a photo of it and put it in your presentation. It means more to us and more to you than, than 100 words would. OK, so use the IOS template or, or make your own. So, right, questions. Questions is always the thing, isn't it? This, this is what you hear, what it's all about. So we'll ask those questions in turn. We might stop you and say, actually, that's fine. We've just heard what we need. That's lovely, we'll move on to the next one. That's ideal, you wanna hear that. Um, if you're not quite getting there, we can probe, but we can't lead. Um, you can ask for clarification or rewording if you like. You know, can you just say, well, I didn't quite understand that. Can you just put it in a different way for me? And then we'll try and do that for you. Give yourself some thinking time, don't rush your answer. Don't be that nervous that you have to rush in on your answer. If you, if you want to just say, Right, let me just think about that for a minute. You know, just give yourself time to gather your thoughts and stay professional with it. Deep breath, sip of water if you need to, speak slowly and clearly. Stay on track though. We do very often have to bring people back onto the subject. So just be concise. Although I say take your time, we do actually, sometimes if people ramble on for too long, we do just say, we'll park that one and we'll move to the next question. We like to hear I, not we. As with your SDP, it's all about you. We want to know about you. If you haven't directly, or if your company or, or wherever you're working 
have done this thing or have risk assessed this object or what it might be, and it wasn't you directly, then you can say, well, my part of the team was. So don't say I did it if you didn't, but we do like to say, you know, use an example. So you could then say, well, actually, if I was to do that, then this is an example of, of how I would work. Um, there are different question sets. So if you know a mate who's just been through your chartership, doesn't mean to say you get the same questions as they do. So there are several, several question sets. Um, the panel, we don't know until the day what's coming up. Um, and it's like official secrets act. But I would have to kill you if I told you anyway, and we would be killed as well, incidentally. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we would, uh, integrity might come into it. Um, so you might be asked about, and this is might be asked about, this is not definite, but it gives you a little bit of a broad idea of the sort of things you can expect. You will almost be definitely be asked something about your route into where you are, so SDP or open book, whichever you come from. We might just get you to talk about that to start with, again, talking about something you know, but we'll probably ask you about your learning from it. So those reflective statements that you've done are going to come in there. And then the core skills questions and the experience questions, something like the following. I'm not saying these will be, but I would suggest you do look at these if you know what I mean, that's me gone. Um, so keeping up to date, you know, how you keep up to date, policies, procedures, how you put a policy together, how you put a procedure together, how you communicate to all levels of the workforce. And as I said, back to basics, you might even get something that says, how do you do a risk assessment or, how would you risk assess so-and-so? Accidents and incidents, you know, the investigations, how you monitor health and safety, best practice in health and safety, human factors, that is a horrible question. <laughs> we don't like asking that one, but sometimes human factors comes up. So, you know, your violations and all those sort of things. So know about human factors, know about health surveillance, know about fire, know about DSE, all those basic solid things that you should know, and actually you do know where you wouldn't have got as far as this anyway. There aren't any tricks. It, it would just really pay you go through your study material and then you should be on the right track. And this one we do get grumpy about if people don't know about the code of conduct. So please know your code of conduct and the four pillars and a little bit about what those pillars mean, not just list them out, but you know, you need to know how you'd apply that maybe or you know how it works so professional conduct we need to know and we need to know that you know about that to be um, a proper occupational so occupational safety and health professional and then sometimes at the end they'll ask you about all right what's your future develop plans what's your cpd look like so a little bit about your study a little bit about your future a little bit about the code of conduct and your basic core skills so that's enough from that otherwise i will be shot um, and then when you come to the end, when you get back to the chair, the final question, you know you're through, so well done, you've got through that hour. Then you've got your summary and thanks by the chair. The IOSH rep will advise on timescales for the results. We say 21 days, um, but very often you'll find you get an email in three or four days. They don't usually take that long unless there's a lot going on at the Grange at the time. Um, the panel will mark individually. So once you go off screen, us as the panel, we don't talk to each other until we've marked and declared our marks. So we're not influenced by each other. So we will write down our marks and you're marked. I think it's out of, it's out of 80 because there are eight questions, but some of the questions are weighted higher or, or lower than others. So it's not just a case of you have to get X amount to pass it's done on percentage terms. And actually we as the panel don't even know how, how IOSH worked that one out, um, but they are weighted slightly differently. Um, pass, hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed, great, everything's, work, it works. If you do fail, we don't call it fail, as I said, we call it refer. It sounds nicer and it is a refer because we refer you for another 12 months. So you've got 12 months to polish your skills and come back and have another go. Okay, what I suggest you do, there is a mock interview on YouTube uh, and that is the, um, the address for it on the web on YouTube. And it's Mark James, he did a mock interview for the staffs branch. Um, it's actually quite still, to, you know, it's like 
question answer. It's, it's not particularly a relaxed looking one, but it does give you an idea of the format and the content. But that was, of course, when we did it on face to face. But it's certainly worth having a look at that if um, if you want to and if you're preparing. And I think that is probably me done. So we will now go back to um, Natasha. That's right, I'm just working. All my things have moved on my screen. I've got to stop sharing up at the bottom and at the top and at the side now because I've moved things around. So I'm just trying to find I did, them. I did wonder <laughs> what was happening. You were talking and pausing and talking and pausing. Yeah, sorry. No, no, beg your pardon. It's fine. Anyway, yeah, that's me, Dan. I hope you found that helpful. And I think we've probably got some questions now, haven't we? We have. We have. I was just titivating, having a look at something. Um, I needed to look at one of the questions. I was I just noticed website. we've got Mr. Ray Hurst in the audience. Welcome. We Ray. have got the letter. He retired Ray last week, bless him. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Andrew was asking about how do we identify a mentor in the mentoring scheme? Um, I think the initial, there's, well, there's a couple of routes, Andrew. I'm not sure if you're a member of our branch or not. Um, but all of the branches are, are quite open usually to you approaching them and talking to them. Um, but there is a, an, the official mentoring scheme you can access through your My IOSH. Um, so if you go onto the IOSH website and log in, you can apply to be a mentor or a mentee. Um, and it will then just ask you some simple questions then about what it is that you need from it so that they can try and match you up with the right people um, and the right person. Um, and just one other thing on that, if it turns out it's not the right person, you're, you can change. Um, I know myself and Angela offer mentoring, um, some through the scheme and some people who just come and see us and chat to us. And that mentoring program looks very different for, for everyone. Some people want a lot of time and a lot of support and others we just talk to once every few months when they hit a hurdle and they just want to sort of shout at someone. So we act as... Most people family. actually do know what they do and they just need that bit of extra confidence and sort of verifying that they're on the right track but yeah we yeah. can give you some pointers if we need to um <clears throat> next one from carly hi carly um with the seven criteria angela does all of the evidence for each criteria have to be specific to one project or scenario or can you provide different evidence and work for the different criteria? yeah when you um when you choose those criteria that I was talking about to start with, you know, you get a huge long list of them out of five sections and you have to choose seven. I think it's five, I can't remember what it is now, so many from one and two from the other. But each of those is a set subject. So mine was that um, creating the safe system of work. And your evidence has got to be the start to finish of that project. So you're telling a story of that project and all the evidence that you provide has to be related to that project and fit into the different activities within that project. So setting up the project, having the meetings, yeah. talking to whoever it might be, doing a site visit, whatever might be within that criterion, within that, as I said, you know, creating the safe system of work. All the activities have to have evidence against them, but it has to be all within that one criterion. Okay. Does that make, does that make sense? Is that what Carly wanted? I think so, yeah. And so for each of the criteria, <clears throat> each of those seven could be a set of different project. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all seven are different, yeah. But the evidence has to be within, Maybe. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I know I was having a question with a, one of the ladies once who, and we looked at what she'd done and actually what she'd done is like I was talking about the open assessment and missing out steps because you're familiar with something. That was the sort of trap that she'd started to fall into where she'd missed some of those key steps that you need to do in a project and just not recorded them quite right. Sort of gone into a bit of waffle speak um, mm. talking about what was going on at the time rather than being that, um, that what's the word? Methodical, I used it earlier. Yeah, I think, I mean, I said put them in time order when, when you create your own document, as you said as well, keep them in that time order, play with them within your own document before you place them into the, the system, if you like. Yeah. Um, and remember that you're telling a story, you know, I don't know, treat the assessor as a child. They don't know what's going on. They're very professional people, I know. <laughs> and I hope there's no assessors listening. But actually, you do need to. You need to prove that you know from start to finish and that you'd lead one of your clients or your organisation through from start to finish. So how I did it, how I set it up, whatever, 
the right to the conclusion at the end with the evidence. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Angela. The um, Jane is asking if it's possible to see the criteria and elements before they apply. Um, is that an option or is it when you sort of register for the ITPD? She's currently an affiliate <clears throat> um, studying her level six. Do you know what I don't, I don't know. You can find all sorts out on the internet, but they aren't all necessarily right, are they? No. Um, I think we should find out and maybe yeah. Maybe put an East Anglia branch post out next week. Just Yeah, we could. Back. Who raised the question? Um, Jane. We've got Jane. a copy of the whole... If you want to put your email address in that would be Jane, in the chat, then I'll I'll have a look and I'll come back to you on that. Yeah, Jane. Let me just. Make sure. That would be amazing. Um, we did have it with me by someone in IOS before I apply. That's Mirza has just said that. Yeah, it can, it can be. Um, you really need the latest guidance and just make sure it is the correct yeah. guidance. That's the only thing I would say. If not, it will send you off at a tangent if somebody gives you sort of bad information. Yeah. Um, so, Jane, if you can pop your um, email address in, I'll keep an eye on it. Yeah, I'll just send it out. Um, the... Christy asked a question, but then Ravi answered it. So I'll just tell you what it is so that you guys <laughs> know if you haven't seen the chat function. Um, Christy asked, well, she asked two questions. First, is there any study material that you would suggest to refer to the study in part A and part B questions? Um, Christine's answer was general IELTS information is available from the website on subject matter, read the syllabus. Um, over and above that, you know, it really is, you know, as Angela says, this is not stuff that you shouldn't know. You know, the, the content of the open assessment for part A and part B are based on safety practitioners knowledge, you know, and general knowledge. If you've studied to, you know, certificate and then diploma level by whichever route, you should have absorbed the information that you will need for this. Um, so really, it's not about lots. It's not really about a lot of um, a lot of study, a lot of homework, a lot of retraining you know you you should be ready you should have that knowledge if you're going through this route i think um, people get a little bit hung up on the idea you know if, i mean if as a consultant i'll go to somewhere that i don't know that has all sorts of widgets that i don't understand yeah and i will then ask them what they do what their role is and whatever they don't know about health and safety i do um yeah so it's the general knowledge of health and safety put into a scenario, but whether it's tarmac in a road or whether it's, um, I don't know, creating so many cardboard boxes on a production line, health and safety has still got the same methodology, still got the same stuff, still got the same rules, still got the same regulations. And that's what we need to know that you know. We don't need to know the specifics of a chemistry lab. You know, it's, yeah, yeah exactly. it's generally. Um, can I just say thank you, James? I was um, looking for that guidance online at the same time as trying to talk. So it's really helpful that you found it and put the link in there for James. Oh, well just done. the link to the um, well latest guidance document. There you go. Maybe. Jane hasn't put her email address in yet. But Jane, if you're listening, perhaps you can just pick up that um, one that James Kent has just put on there for us. Thank you, James. Um, and then a bit about, um, about how, what to expect from candidates, how to write for Part B in the open assessment. Um, one of the others was saying it was really difficult. They've just been through it, but it's really difficult to get it concise because, like I say, you only get 700 words for each bit, um, and that is quite difficult. So, you know, Ravi said in here about understanding action verbs. So, for those of you who've done general certificate stuff, you will know those action verbs that everyone used to have to know um, and sort of learn parrot fashion. If not, it might be worth just looking back over some of those old papers that exist um, because they are about now. Um, for labels, general cert stuff, just for the style of writing, really. Um, One thing that somebody, somebody told me once years ago was instead of rambling, yeah. if you've got a question to answer, you write down the bullet points of what you need to get in there. One, you'll have them in there. If you're doing a, an exam where somebody's invigilating, at least you'll have those bullet points in and you'll exactly. get the prizes for it. But you can then expand on those bullet points and then fill out your 700 words. But you yep. know you've got your bullet points in within that then, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. yeah, I think and that's what we would do with, you know, the questions around legislation. What legislation is it and which regulation within it is it that you want to reference and then work out where you're going to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's how these things are marked. They want to know your knowledge mm. um, and that it's in the right order. Um, 
interviews do they have to be done in person or is there a virtual option um and where they're all virtual now at the moment but they they have been done at different centres in the UK. I think there were four centres um, until Bristol burnt down for some reason. I don't know what happened to Bristol, but it burnt down. Um, there's, there's London, there's um, the Grange, obviously, at Leicester. There was Bristol. I can't remember there's another one as well. But we're not got back to face-to-face -to -face just yet, although it is being thought about. But at the moment, they're all virtual. So you can sit in your own front room or your own office at home or your own office at work, and you don't have to travel anywhere. We'll come to you. Amazing. A um, couple other questions, and then I think we're done. I haven't seen anything else coming in. Um, Debbie's asking about the peer review. So she's saying, it's a very interesting question, to be fair. What if a third party is used for policies, etc., and you were asked how you have influenced them? Would it go against you if your company is a consultant instead? Um, or would that be a, if I were to have influence question? Yeah, I think it's, it's like any other. If you haven't had direct um experience of whatever the question subject is you can say well but I, I would say you know well actually I don't have direct experience of that but I know from my study if I was yeah I would do x y and z um so I would just put yourself into the scenario um pretend you're a consultant and you're going onto that site or <laughs> that you're going to review that policy for someone and you know, if I was going to do that this is what I would do this is what my study tells me I would do yeah exactly and and the other thing is um Angela just putting my consultant's hat on is that those organizations that do use external providers for those sorts of things you know you you should be having some influence on yeah, it in absolutely. one way or another um just throw that in there because I can't not say it um something to do with the code of conduct and needing to say things when they're important I think mm -hmm. um last one can we draw on examples for the questions that are outside of the most recent two-year period for the question portion of the interview Okay, so because obviously, Hang on. The, yeah, the, the, in, two the interview, the two year period is for your SDP. Yeah, for those, those seven criterion that you choose, that's your two year period, your interview, you can draw on whatever you like, it's your experience of health and safety and what you've done. So the two year rule doesn't apply there. Excellent. I thought that was the answer, but I thought I should let you answer it with it being your section. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we have to be fair, don't we? Um, amazing. So that really has concluded this afternoon's session. Um, we've overrun a short bit. I'm really apologise for that. Um, it's not uncommon when me and Angela do a session to overrun a <laughs> while. You're saying we talk too much? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never said that. I'm sure someone would. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so if you've got any other questions, anything you need, then get in touch with the branch or with your branch. Um, I just wanted to say a thank you to the UAE branch um, and Syed, who chairs it, just for, they've been promoting this event as well. And to any of you from the UAE who have attended, it's been really lovely to have you here and great that you're getting involved. Um, just one quick update for my, um, I'm just going to stop the recording, hold on one second.